a science which helps us directly to experience nature and actually when we walk in the wood understand it more deeply and uh, and more profoundly than we do now something that tells us something we don't know about the quality of woods trees the nature of the bird song we hear how they communicate i mean i think they just call signs their songs and the actual message is as it were telepathic once they've tuned in through the right cause this kind of world we might come to live in and actually experience and the mathematical models just wouldn't seem I don't think terribly interesting or important. Well, so this is the connection to the psychedelic experience, the felt realm of immediate perception, that somehow with the psychedelics we're coming into the full spectrum of our experiential birthright. And you're saying that this theory correctly assimilated brings us also into a full appreciation of the felt uh, spectrum of experience that is our birthright. It makes us realize that we're living in a magical world in which there are unseen connections, that the, the power of thought and imagination and dream actually has a reality. And our ancestors lived in such a world. And the, you know, the, the whole medieval and animistic world and the, and the worlds before that. And most people in the, in, this, in the whole of world have lived in such a world, a world in which these things are possible. It's only since the 17th century that our civilization has stripped the world of its magic. And it's stripped the world of its magic by turning it into a machine. And if it becomes a living organism again, alive once again, as I think it's becoming, then it's a living thing and we have to relate to it as living things and the disembodied mind approach of totally abstract mathematics seeing the universe as if from without the whole point of the mechanistic picture is that you withdraw yourself from the world you see the world as a spinning ball as we've now finally through the space mission come to see the world it's a total confirmation of the initial leap of the mechanism of copernicus the it's a proof of the copernican theory in the most dramatic form, because there it was to step off the Earth, which everyone else had taken the Earth as the center from which to model things, because it's the center from which we experience them, and it's true to our experience. Um, saying that's not the center at all, and Kepler in 1609 wrote this science, early work of science fiction, The Dream, when he imagined himself being in a transport, a visionary state, transported to the moon, from the moon, on the moon encountering strange creatures that lived underground and crawled out from under rocks. And looking back at the Earth and seeing the Earth spinning on its axis, just as astronauts and our cameras see it from the moon. And using this in his book, The Somnium, to persuade people by this thought experiment to see that the Earth could be moving, even though they themselves experienced the rest of the heavens to be moving. And this is the thought experiment that takes our minds off the Earth and puts them out in space, and then through Newtonian space takes them outside the entire universe until they occupy the same vantage point as the imagined god of a mechanistic world machine, somehow external to the mechanism. And this is the world in which Laplace and, and his followers thought that their minds were actually dwelling through experiencing these eternal mathematical truths, learning them in physics textbooks. And there they were, the eternal truths of the universe, as known by God, if such a God existed. And so the human mind was totally abstracted from the whole universe, leaving the body and the feelings behind in some other kind of realm, the realm of everyday life, poetry, imagination, religion, etc. But the intellectual understanding of the whole universe, which was finally applied to the whole of this earth, to the whole of life, to the whole of the human body, and finally to the whole of the human brain, purporting to explain everything in terms of this abstracted intellectual vision rooted in eternity, as the mind of the scientist somehow outside the universe observing it. This has been collapsing. I mean, the observer in quantum theory, the unworkability of that view, and now the collapse of any justification for eternal laws. And so I think that we don't really have to stay in that. You know, we have to change our whole way of experiencing it, yes. And it is an archaic <coughs> return. It is a brief intellectual detour since the 17th century, as mm. you point out. Terence's interest in the time flows, and I'm interested in the habits. But I think they're complementary, because <coughs> you're never going to understand the quality of time flow if you haven't already understood the power and nature of habit. 
because there's no doubt whatever that a great deal of the time flow that's happening, in spite of all the fluctuations, involves the persistence of a vast number of habits, which is why we're all here tonight. If these habits, uh, the major ones by which we live from day to day, our bodies work, our language works, our social conventions work, and, and so on, if, if these habits were severely disrupted, the, 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 it would be uh, virtually impossible even to sit here and talk about it. We're here because there's a vast stability of habit. And so I think that one has to understand the habits as well as the, they're two sides of the same coin in a sense. The, the, the time flow and its quality are what affects or it's, it's the other side of the coin of habit and the understanding them goes together I think. But I would think, see the primary task as I see it, for me at any rate, is to try and establish the nature of these habits. Once we understand the nature of habits better, I think it would be easier to set up if one wanted to study the nature of time flow around, one would, I suppose, look for correlated events around the world, seeing whether certain patterns of events tended to happen around the world. What Jung would call synchronicities, which he thought of as manifesting some kind of underlying pattern in the flow of time. And so one, the study of synchronicities already exists, of course. Jung initiated it, or even before him, Camera and others. Um, so that's one way of looking at time flow, because synchronicities suggest there's something behind the scenes of what appear to be um, new events in different places. So, no, these are complementary approaches. It's not one or the other. And I think both, both the study of synchronicities and the quality of time might help to explain a lot of anomalies in scientific experiments. Very few scientific experiments are repeatable, in fact. And um, they're repeatable only approximately. Now, I've spent years teaching practical classes in Cambridge and other universities, Harvard, um, teaching practical classes to undergraduates in biochemistry is an enlightening experience because they're only given Ex ex experiments to do, which are textbook experiments. Everybody al already knows work. I mean, you wouldn't give students something that's not going to work. Um, so you give them the most certain, established, and, and, and repetitive and repeatable of all the systems you can think of. You don't want them right out at the research frontiers where results fluctuate wildly and no one knows really what's going on until it's sort of stabilized, been published, and become a kind of habit of thought and expectation. You give them things that are already believed by everyone to work. And you, the results you get are astounding. They're all over the place. I mean, they're, they're, even competent undergraduates, are, <laughs> the, 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 the results are extremely variable. For any biological experiment I've ever had in hundreds of the ones I've conducted in lab classes, they're given the same apparatus, the same pipettes, the same solutions, the same, you know, lab technician put these things out by the dozen in first year and second year undergraduate practical laboratories. And the results are all over the place. Well, even in third year undergraduate things, in graduate studies, the results keep coming out all over the place. And you explain away the ones that don't work. Either they didn't know the technique, they put the wrong solution in, they must have done it this, you must have done that, you must have done the other. And you can find a hundred ways to explain why this actually happens. The only actual examples we have where people try to repeat experience, experiments on a mass scale turn out to be highly unrepeatable. And most scientists don't spend their time repeating standard experiments and measuring whether they fluctuate or not, they're always getting on to the next thing. And so this ideal has never been tested. And um, I think if it is tested, we'd find synchronized, perhaps synchronized fluctuations in the way experiments work in labs around the world. People have lab notebooks kept separately. The date, the way of presenting the experiments, you never mention the date you did it. It's assumed that 